Warm welcome. We will begin the workshop with the keynote lecture from uh, Professor Rakunanthan. To give a brief introduction about Professor Rakunanthan, he is a professor in IISE, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He obtained his bachelor's from IIT Bombay, PhD from IISE. His research interests are combustion and propulsion, internal flows, heat and mass transfer, energy technologies for rural areas. Uh, now I request Professor Rakunanthan to kindly deliver his presentation. Thanks to the group, Professor Sujit, uh, Professor Mahesh, the Purdue group, uh, for asking me to be present here today. Uh, I looked at, I was working in the area of combustion, hardcore combustion, until the middle of 80s. I remember the days when I first submitted a paper for the, one of the journals and then on the arc ignition of gaseous fuels. That was published and I tried to follow it up with arc ignition of sprays. It probably came back telling me that you don't know the droplet sizes. Now, that was a time when our diagnostics was extremely poor. It was only in in the middle of 90s, I managed to get a Malvern particle sizer, and I found suddenly I was in demand in the country. Uh, not many people had even that, and I know that it's now today the state of art is very much different. But the, with that, I could work with the GTRE, Jai Prakash and others used to come to me, and uh, DRDO, BHEL, and so on. So a large number of people were looking at me to produce some data for their injectors. While looking at these problems, I could see some certain mechanistic phenomena, which is, is actually uh, somewhat intriguing. Not all of them can be easily explained. There's something with some interesting data. So what I'm going to talk to you today is some mechanistic studies or a range of atomization problems related to aerospace propulsion. Well, this is, of course, everybody is very, very familiar. A gas having combustor, with, uh, which will have uh, the injector there, and then the, it burns, and then it needs to be diluted after combustion, and then you need to give the right type of pattern factor at the exit of the combustor. And the large part of it is really controlled by this little element there, the injector at the, at the entry of the combustion chamber, and there are a number of such atomizers. I don't need to explain to all these people. That's one of them which came to me for, for a test was a, a dual orifice type of uh, atomizer. And I did go through. I don't want to tell you all, give you all these minor details, which are very familiar. This is what the data showed when I measured with uh, uh, Malvern. Uh, this is on the, oh, sorry. This, this is the speed. Uh, equivalent speed, well, corresponding to that, one can simulate the pressure drop in the, uh, across the atomizer. And if you look at, there is a primary flow, there is a secondary flow, the two con the jets come out, and then if you look at the, only the primary spray, this is how the droplet size is about, you know, very fine. And you look at the secondary spray, which comes into play after certain speed, and then this is the secondary spray. And the two, you combine and then try to measure the drop size. If there was something very straightforward and you could see that the, the combined spray should have light somewhere in between. It could not happen. The fact that it started giving combined spray, this of course, there's some data beyond this. There is uh, this type of data. There is this part, if you look at this, mean drop size is much larger than the drop sizes measured for the primary and the secondary. And that uh, act, uh, motivated me to look at this phenomenon a little more carefully. At the same time, I had a, an injector from, from Indian Space Research Organization also trying to look at the, the coaxial type of system where we need to measure. This is, of course, a little different. Uh, this was a UDMH, you know, N2O4 type of system, which is a hypergolic. It's a little different. But then the phenomena, basic phenomena is roughly the coaxial system. And what did we do? We went through, I, I don't know if Dr. Shivkumar is here. Shivkumar was the, my student at that point of time. He was uh, working with me, and this is what we were trying to do. Look at the uh, creator spray here. You have an annular flow and a core flow. You give swirl to both of them. So they're both the 
the primary and the secondary halves swirl, and they create a mixed uh, spray downstream. This is a phenomenon I was try trying to refer to. You, you keep the, uh, it's now plot shown in terms of Weber number because of the lots of data. I'm, I'm not trying to give you the whole lot of information right now. We can probably get to a discussion later. So this is uh, uh, the outer spray, and you keep on increasing the Weber number. This, you can just do it by increasing, say, the velocity of this uh, internal jet here. It's also a, uh, it starts with a very, you know, tulip bulb type of shape, and then it expands. Now, what really happens is, as you keep increasing the inner flow, that there is a, a, a suction effect there. So there's an entrainment. The outer jet comes closer, and this outer jet, at some point of time, as an eye, eye of the, the, the spray here. There's a small region where the two, you know, come and mix. There's an internal circulation that really sets in here. Now, what's interesting uh, is this. You come to that particular critical condition where the two are likely to merge. And what you do is you set this condition. You set both the inner and outer flow, bring it to that condition, and leave it for a while. All that happens, this is a sequence of the photographs when you don't do anything, but there's a movie, you know, if you take a sequence of pictures, what, how the spray, de spray develops, and then this is how the, the external spray, now this just sort of, you know, it draws the outer spray and then merges at some point. Now, after this, this is you're going to have, and this is what we normally perceive it as a spray in a steady state that you see. But then to get to this state, it will have gone through all of it, as I said, spray set there, you don't do anything. This is a time phenomena. In that process, it, they come together and form a combined spray of this nature. You know, you can imagine that same thing should happen when you try to reduce the flow rate. When you try to see that the inner spray, you know, inner flow rate is reduced, and you, you keep doing it, the sort of thing which starts from here, and then it gets to this state, at some critical condition, it merges. Now that again, you go through a sequence there, a separation transition process, if you look at, somewhere this merged here and it goes down, somewhere around this place it starts separating. It's as though the two liquid sheets are peeled out from one, one another. And this particular sheet after comes out and then finally you have an inner spray here. So there are, this is what you see at the steady state. So this, this little transition that takes place seems quite interesting. And how you approach this now is becomes the important part. What really happens is if you, if, as I mentioned, the process, I am in this particular set of experiments that I just described, is the outer flow rate is kept constant uh, and the inner flow rate is raised. And the two sheets which are separate merge at certain conditions. And if you like to look at and try to separate the two sheets again, you keep decreasing, and then you see separation takes place at a much lower flow rates. Obviously, it's happening because there are new forces which have come into play for the separation process. Surface tension becomes far more dominant in the, in the inner, inner uh, eye, as I mentioned, and that's uh, what I think is a, is a problem which is worth looking at in terms of describing this coaxial spray systems. And uh, there is an up, there is something important with this. If you go through this measurement of the drop size distribution around this hysteresis region that I showed, this is the region which I showed as the hysteresis here, and there is a, depending on how you approach that, that zone here, and you get different droplet sizes at the same flow conditions. And therefore, if you, uh, if you try to measure, you will get the forward branch, you will find that in the hysteresis region, you'll have smaller droplets, but in the reverse, you get a, a larger droplet because it's a merged system. This is also verified with some of this reference, you know, work in terms of obscuration from the spray and so on. But the important point is to see, how do we describe this particular eye? I think that's one problem. I think uh, the, this particular group might be interested. Another problem connected with the gas turbine sprays, which uh, I was to look at, this of course came with our own experiments because we were looking at an extreme sensitivity of the spray to geometric factors. Very small changes in the geometry made so much of difference in the 
the optimization process in terms of measurements. So we try to create all this just to look at this as a plane jet uh, air blast optimizer, trying to have the air flow here, the liquid flow comes here. And you just make the way they mix together at the tip. You make the changes. It makes the difference of optimization process. Now this is, we have obtained a large amount of data. Uh, I don't think I have a complete explanation for all of it, because except that you say that you make the impingement there. But then the, at least you can say that if you, if these are the different ways you can make them impinge. Well, at the tip, uh, you can make the uh, two straight like this, or you can make it, uh, this one is a, a converging type of things, or you can have a recess part, you can have converging flow at this point, and you just make this little difference and then try to measure the drop sizes there. And you get a large number of data that we have on this particular part. You get it in terms of momentum ratio. You can still plot it in a reasonable plot. But then explanation of this, can we really model this, is a question. A third problem is, of course, we're trying to look at breakup of uh, uh, liquid jets from elliptic orifices. It has several applications, elliptic orifices, I, out of which what should be at least of uh, relevance to my talk, although all of them may be of interest to this particular group, looking at space in a variety of uh, applications, was that if you look at, uh, there, is a, there is of course an intent right, by the engine manufacturers to see that you can want to cut down the number of parts of the injector and then see instead of having a number of circular orifices, can you put elliptic orifices, so the number of part count will come down. The another problem is uh, whether you can really change the pattern factor because the circular pattern factor is going to be uh, largely, you know, it's high simply because there are discrete uh, ways you inject. Can we distribute the, the fuel more uniformly? That was the one. But I don't, I, I, we have not really gone to that, that particular part. But we wanted to look at it in a, in a different perspective. Idea was, you know that uh, elliptic jets as they come out, there is a process of access switching. If the access switching is now, you know, after all, the jet breakup ha happens to be because of the rally type of instability. And if you superpose that with, with an with a, uh, access switching phenomena, what is it that's going to do? That's the type of problem which we were trying to address. Uh, this, is, this is what I said. This is what uh, happens with the access switching in the normal jets. <clears throat> so we, we've created an, an elliptic orifice. I must say that to create an orifice of this nature was itself a very, fairly difficult issue at that point of time. And you have, so we try to make it uh, what we say is equivalent, you know, this is, you try to find the uh, same type of area and you create uh, with the very different uh, aspect ratios, you know, changing from one all the way up to 5.84, it's fairly extended. So number of elliptic orifices and try to look at the way if the jets behave in terms of the simple breakup. Well, this is what is done. You take pictures from two angles, and then we had to look at a large number of them at uh, uh, different uh, Weber numbers. What you find is this first uh, breakup, that is what uh, we now look at. That is still follows the same line, which is the, the rally breakup type of phenomena, irrespective of, you know, it follows along that. But then the way it deviates, happens to the first, uh, you know, it's the first particular point. If this is a circular one, the square, dark ones, black ones, and this is where it deviates from this, and then this is the way it breaks up, and then it gets it. These are all the well-known, uh, you know, uh, way the uh, jets break up. But with the elliptic jets, this part, part point, the critical point gets, starts shifting. And then it's actually, it just starts breaking up at a, in a lower web number conditions. So you find that this breakup phenomena is actually the whatever the whatever I mentioned as the as the access switching process is going to be dominant in in some region here. Beyond of course is it's not it's not going to be seen as much. Evidently in this particular part initially in this region it, the circular, the elliptic jet, as it comes out, it really becomes uh, with the low velocity. It tries to attain the circular, you know, shape and then breaks there. But then it is in this region you find a very drastic effect of uh, elliptic orifice. It's the shape of the orifice becomes uh, very, very important. 
again, a problem which uh, probably uh, should be of interest to many people. Maybe we'll hear about them by others. Yeah. Uh, another one. This, uh, these are what we said, uh, gas turbine type of related type of problems we looked at. In rocket uh, propulsion, it's also another aerospace device, liquid propellant rockets. The impinging jets are very common. You have a variety of impinging jets. We're looking at, uh, depending on the type of application, you may have a, what is called a, a doublet, uh, like doublet, uh, unlike doublet, triplets, split triplets. All of them exist in practice in different applications. So we're trying to see all of them uh, and see how, how do they behave. Uh, and this is, of course, a subject that's been studied for long by many people. This, that. But then there's still the, uh, the full phenomena is, you know, this is a type of rocket where you make it, you know, just to see the large number of orifices. Uh, something like a Viking engine or a Vickers engine would probably have near, nearly, I don't know if these are people here, maybe a thousand such orifices there in that and so on. So you, you have a large number of them. And some of them, particularly if you look at the reaction control thrusters at some applications, they don't even have access to drill the hose carefully. They drill it from the outlet side. So the inlet point is really uh, something not, they may not really have very fine control as they work with them. Yeah, these are some of the many different. There are a variety of impinging systems there. Now this is, of course, an old one, which is there, uh, which is very clear, the two jets mix and then they, they create a fan at normal to the two jets, and you get a spray fan from this. Okay, what we did was we started with a doublet. Doublet, you impinge, you see how the droplet size varies, varies with respect to jet velocity. You can change the orifice dimension, you can change the angle of impingement, you can change the velocity of impingement, you have a number of parameters there. So you can get that, it's very clear, as velocity increases, the droplet size decreases, and uh, depending if the angle becomes steeper, velocity, the particle size decreases. This, these are, of course, uh, very easily explicable. Try to plot it in terms of in an empirical form, and then got this in terms of what I refer to as the specific normal momentum, which tells you that normal momentum divided by the mass that is present at the point of impingement, mass flux that's there at that point of flux. Triplets, you look at them, and you have a, a primary jet there. There's an inclined jet coming from two sides. And you can also make the same type of measurements with varying inclined jet velocities, varying primary jet velocities. You can change the angles. You can change the orifice dimension. You can do a variety of these things as, as, as uh, demanded by applications. And you try to plot that data. You again get something of this nature. As I said, this is, this is how it is, uh, momentum is described. I was then looking at the fact that, uh, is this something, a parameter that I should be looking at for all applications? We try to look at the split triplet. The split triplet has got, you know, either two jets mix at some point, and then they really, uh, the jets do not break at this point. They still impinge again. So there is a second impingement that takes place there in these atomizers. So you can really look at it as a doublet. So you can look at it as an equivalent doublet and then try to look at it. And this particular process, again, you, you can decide as to what is the equivalent doublet uh, that you can create out of it, simple geometric and momentum balance. Now you look at this one. All the data, whether you look at doublets, triplets, split triplets, all of them, you still plot it in this matter. And then manner, and then you get a fairly good uh, correlation in terms inversely like the, the momentum part of it. Now, again, how do split triplets and interact? Could be something this particular group might uh, like to go further and uh, make, make some calculations on this. Uh, one other problem that uh, I had looked at was the fact that uh, what happens in this impingement if there's a skew? Two jets do not meet exactly as we expect, normal, but then there's a skew between the jets. Why did I get to this problem at all? This is one of the practical injectors that came to me for test. Actually, it's a triplet, not a doublet. It's a, 
It's a twin triplets. Now it's it the jets meet at a point very well at some flow conditions, but at some other flow conditions they do not meet. So there is a skewing that is taking place here. So the the question was how do these jets behave in a skewed condition? Now that is the problem that I was trying to address. Now if you look at uh, this particular process, you can create a skew. If you do a skewed impingement, you are going to get, a, you can expect to get a, a, an inclined jet. The jets now have a rotation. So you can get a spray of this nature. And what I did was uh, create uh, uh, a sort of uh, in a mechanical pattern. You have about 144, you know, a, a matrix of 144 collectors arranged so that you know how the mass is going to be distributed. So you look at the perfect impingement, you get something this. I think the minor uh, uh, variations are simply because you cannot make a very fine measurement in this type of system, but you can collect the mass convert it into set of a contours, mass flow contours. Now, if you do that, you will get a, a good impingement. If you keep on giving a, a skewing, you say a 20% offset or all the way up to 95% offset from the jet, and now you have a twisted jet, and that's going to create a spray. Now, this one, the mass fluxes, as you see rightly, they also get skewed, as you see it in the, in the, in the collectors. Uh, so you can do that. Well, just as a matter of check, you go through the reverse and you get the same type of skewing that happens. So the jets now impinge, create a, a tangential motion. Now there's, there is a, a, a jet which is twisted, still having some moment of tangential component in it. Now what really means, uh, well, this is, this is the way you can look at it and this is also a picture towards that. And you see that the way it is uh, impinging here at this point, and it's almost normal to the two jets, keep on creating a, an offset or a, a skewing, and it keeps twisting and then comes what you think should be, what you expect or what you intend to be normal, it really becomes some more like a parallel type of uh, spray fan you create. And uh, this is something well within we could expect it is well within you know what we could think should happen there is nothing very nothing very drastic but what interested me more was uh, this particular data now if you create this this is what i have here is the the uh, what is called skewness uh, that is it's offset from the center axis switching there axis uh, mismatch there and you look at this this one if you increase the skew well you should take this as 95 percent close to 100%. Now, if you look at this one, it keeps on decreasing. I, I would have expected from all that you said was something like a momentum, normal momentum dominating, it creates all the spray, and then therefore I would have expected if it skews, it's a less of impingement that's really taking place, and the drop sizes would uh, increase as you increase the skewness. But then there's something else that happens, as you there, you really create a sheet which is, which is having a rotary component. It thins, and then you get a much finer droplet. So we don't have to be bothered very much. If it happens to have certain skewness, your mass distribution will be varied, but you'd still get finer droplets. There's no problem as such. But then as one wants to model this, I think this may be of interest to people to look at this. The last topic that I would like to look at is, uh, we have looked at effervescent automation. Now why did, again, I get, get into effervescent automation? In, the, in uh, I was looking at uh, throttling of the rocket motors. When you try to throttle, that is you want to reduce the thrust level or change the, vary the thrust levels, what you do in almost all the systems is that you change the pressure drop across the injector. Whatever means the mechanism, it could be through the uh, either, a, uh, you know, reduce the turbine conditions or uh, you have a flow regulator or pressure regulator in the rocket motors and so on. So finally, you have to, the pressure drop is reduced so that the mass flow is reduced so you get a different thrust. But when your mass flow is reduced, or say you, you throttle down, pressure drop reduces, it's going to have a, an effect on drop sizes. So drop sizes tend to go up. 
drop sizes tend to go up and then if you have done optimization of the combustion chamber length for a specific drop sizes, then you have this is going to be a part of it is going to be unburnt and there's a little loss of efficiency that's going to take place. Now, is it possible now if we can uh, do some other way such that uh, irrespective of throttling, uh, I can still get the desired particle sizes in the combustion chamber. So, we that uh, at that time looking at this, I thought the effervescent automation might be very, very uh, nice in this particular regard. So, we looked at this is of course the gas to liquid ratio, which uh, people are uh, very familiar. This is the, uh, uh, you will change the mix ratio of the gas to liquid and try to get this in an effervescent automizer. Uh, well, all that you do is you have a liquid that, that comes in the center here. This is uh, one gas is let in here. This is a chamber where it mixes and comes out with the orifice. So, you, you can change the mixture ratio by looking at the liquid and gas flow. This is the way it drops. So, you find uh, the, the, this ratio increases again, well, very well known result, nothing very, nothing very extraordinary about it. Uh, this you keep on increasing the gas to liquid ratio, the drop sizes comes very, very fine. And uh, what was particularly interesting to me was the fact that uh, just at about uh, 3 to 4 percent level, you can get an extremely fine, autom fairly automized from even from a fairly large orifices you get a very fine automization with the effervescent automizers. So, what I was trying to do at that point of time, which was there in automization space, you, you try to uh, create a sort of a transfer function. You have, I say, in any way, the rocket motors have the pressure bottles there. They have the pressure available there. So, if you can really uh, have a system, a mechanic or electromechanical device, such that for a given position of the fuel or propellant flow, you can alter the gas flow into the system. You can still get the same drop sizes, irrespective of wide range of uh, throttling that you can do. Now, that was the idea. I was trying to create this uh, uh, pressure, you know, for different uh, water injection pressure, which is what I did, and then look at the air inlet pressure and create this sort of a transfer function, and then I. I I did build something, a device, small device, which will sense this pressure and then try to alter the, the pressure on the air side, so that you get the same drop sizes. But just around that time, I had uh, interaction with uh, several other groups here, and they drew my attention to the fact that in scramjet engine, there is this barbotaging that is what the uh, word probably the Russians use. Barbotaging is done and then they introduce small amount of gas and then into the liquid stream and then automate it and then you will get uh, very fine drop sizes. Idea is of course clear. Scramjet engines you have you know, typically whether any of the missions that you take in the world wide you, you have a meter long uh, combustion chamber. If you look at the evaporation and combustion process, you just have uh, about a millisecond uh, residence time. In one millisecond, it should be completely burned. So, you must have very fine droplets, something of the order of 20 microns, so that the combustion is complete inside the scrambled combustion chamber. So, you want to get that, that what I, whatever data I had generated looked like uh, it's a good way of generating the, the fine droplets for the optimization process. Uh, idea that we had was, of course, you anyway, the scramjet engines today looking at uh, hydrogen combustion and also the uh, kerosene combustion type of system. So, you, you can also use hydrogen in kerosene, barbotage it and then give a, give a spray. Uh, at least some people said they have tried it and it has functioned well. I did make some measurements for some uh, organizations, uh, but then we wanted to look at it in much greater detail. Now, we did the, uh, one of my students has looked at in fair amount of detail. He's looked at, uh, we have a, a system where, you know, this is, a, is, is about a, a 50 millimeter window that we can view how it breaks up. As all of you uh, know that uh, we look at uh, effervescent optimization in three discrete regimes. One is, of course, the bubble explosion at very small flow rates where fine droplets get into the stream and then they explode as they come out. The two-phase flow there, 
is which chokes at a much lower flow rate and therefore it comes out with a little pressure in the in the stream it explodes although i have uh, some other work but i have not uh, brought them here so you can see that the droplets come out and they break so you have and that part of atomization is largely because of the explosion phenomena there micro explosion there is a, a final a large flow rate region where the air stream or the gas stream gets into the core and then it flows in the core creates what you call the annular spray region so you have two regions of the bubble explosion annular flow region but it is in between you have what we what is generally referred to as the slug flow rate it could it can be either one of them or a, a large bubbles coming out it is that part which is i think is something that needs a lot more attention i will also see now what we try to do in this particular work is uh, you try to look at the fact uh, where is the first break up that's going to take place the first complete severing of the the downstream from the upstream jet as that look at the bubble bursting before distance as such where do you find this you see you see as the flow changes you can also see a pattern here as you see that uh, it is this one doesn't seems to break somewhere downstream closer and this is broken earlier and so on this is much broken earlier here it's more like a conical air blast the conventional air uh, assisted spray like so this is a type of system so can we really quantify it what appears like uh, absolute random phenomena droplets coming bubbles exploding and so on can we really quantify it in some fashion so we try to look at a large number of pictures in this we have about 50 or so and see where is the first break up that's going to take place so first severing and try to look at that uh, locate that point that's with some high speed photographs here and uh, you try to plot this distance what we call the bubble bursting distance and with respect to number of frames you find this happening so it is a phenomena where you find at different condition you know uh, you take the same flow condition you take a high speed photograph you find a bubble bursting at different uh, distances and try to make a histogram out of it and this is uh, what you get at uh, two distinct uh, flow rates as uh, i've seen here 0.3 liters per minute 0.6 liters per minute and so you still find something close to a, a normal distribution so you can look at it now quantify it and then therefore you can describe it in terms of either the mean bubble bursting distance most probably way where is it likely to break that you can quantify this and of course you can quantify it in terms of standard deviation and so on this is how it you uh, if you try to convert the same data into the distribution you will get in the probability function you will get it in the in this fashion the the look at the instantaneous bubble bursting distance and this is how the distribution is so you find what is plotted here is for the different flow rates and you find the mean distance it keeps on increasing uh, uh, it keeps on decreasing as you go from this one to this one as the flow rate is really increased and that's of course the spread becomes narrower and narrower now this is the type of phenomena that you find in a an atomizer of this nature this we took it further we want to see what really happens inside now there is again a different reason for that if you try to look at literature as there i think purdue is of course well known for this type of uh, atomization process and several other groups which they have done the the measurements that i if you try to plot and say for the same gas to liquid ratio percentage there are considerable differences in the drop size it's not that it's one single parameter which is universally describing it there's something else that's happening which is important that is at least in those experiments that we are talking of so is there a, you know is something to do with the internal flow how the flow develops inside in the mixing chamber how does it come out of the orifice is that uh, what is possible so that's why we are trying to look at the internal flow made a transparent system try to look at it of course is a is a two dimension we've taken pictures from one angle and then trying to look at the drop sizes that are coming out you get a range of them from the uh, you see that from a low jlr to high jlr the configuration what's happening inside is very very different 
And uh, that uh, we try to again try to see if we can look at distribution of this. This, of course, take it with a little pinch of salt because we are trying to look at drop sizes as two dimensional and they are not perfectly spherical there. You need to define an equivalent uh, diameter for that. And then you try to look at this one, you again get a distribution of this type. That's what's happening inside. So there is a process that's inside, which is also can be statistically described. There's a process that's taking place outside, which is also can be described. I don't know whether I can relate exactly one to one, but I think that's something, a food for what discussion that you might really have. Yeah. Uh, next topic under this, as I said, this is one which is of a recent origin, that's why I'm spending a little longer time. Uh, spray pattern. If you try to see the, what is a spray pattern in the effervescent automizer. This is two parts we have done. We did certain mechanical and my student went to Canada with uh, Concordia University. They, they have an optical pattern there and they have used it. Uh, so we tried to get the pattern distribution, mass flow patterns. So you find the you know, this is uh, for a low JLR, you get a distribution of this nature and uh, you will get it for a the, the larger JLR, you get the pattern distribution like this. Now, what's, what I'm trying to say is if you say, if you look at it, this is at random, this is, this is the way you get. Sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's uh, spreading, this is, this is how it happens. And whereas if you get to a higher flow rate, this is where it's trying to get into an annual pattern, something for more uniform and more steady type of system will emerge out of this. This is just about to come out in publication. Uh, so this is the spray pattern part of it. Uh, we tried something more. If it is the internal flow, which is dictating the type of drop sizes that you are going to get, type of uh, atomization that's going to happen downstream, can we also look at the fact that I, I deliberately create a system where it is different? Now it's what uh, you know. Is uh, people uh, call this as uh, inside out, where the gas enters from inside and gets into the liquid stream, which is outside, or the this one is what's called outside in the gas coming from outside, getting into the liquid stream. But then we thought we will try to say that we don't really allow any mixing process that would take place in the mixing chamber. Let's try to have it exactly inside the orifice there in a little longer orifice and let it flow through that. So we created this, two different uh, jets working at same conditions and this is how you get the first one which is the internal mixing takes place. This is the way you find the breakup process. Well, the one which is mixing as an outside in which is mixing in the orifice region where directly you don't allow for mixing there and it really gets into this type of flow rate, this one which is uh, steady somewhat and it's a, a narrower cone that you will get in this process at the same GLR conditions. So this is uh, studied further, uh, two different, you find uh, lots of fluctuations in the first one, somewhat steady in the second one. It, if you are trying to look at the mean drop size, you may have to work with this, you have to sacrifice steadiness in some sense. If you are trying to look at uh, uniformity, steady state, you may have to work with the higher GLRs, get into an annular mode in this type of injectors. Yeah, uh, you try to do these two configurations that I just described. You try to look at the way drop sizes are there. You will still really find this injector A configuration, which is the star here and the uh, red triangle. They are all lower here. And uh, the other one, the injector B, where you try to mix it, near the orifice, they are larger. So in this, is, of course, eventually it will come close by, but on the downstream at the higher JLR also, you can come to the same type of configuration. But it is here that you find a large difference between the two type of configuration. And it is here that you find lots of discrepancy in the literature that in that percentage level that you have different. So the internal flow, the way you mix, and that seem to be uh, important. Now this one of the recent publications that uh, uh, cone angle for the same type of configuration, a cone angle as I said, what you see over a region is, you see because of the explosion you get a larger angle and the other one is a, is a annular type of system which is uh, somewhat narrow. 
I come to the last bit. I, I, I am not uh, intending to describe all of it. The next question is, can we describe this process of atomization from effervescent and model it? So this we have spent some effort. I'm not now giving you all the details, trying to see whether trap bubbles, you look at them, li liquid jet. Actually, if you look at it, the jet comes out and try to track a bubble and say, it's actually somewhere in this region, if it expands, it breaks at this end. This is uh, in, the, in the upper part of the bubble. It's where it uh, bubbles really, sh you know, burst first. And how do we model it is a question. We try to look at it in terms of, uh, you know, looking at the fact that uh, Purdue Leffer was data, if this model that we have done, some data that uh, Dr. Ramurthy here, who is that? Uh, Dr. Ramurthy from IIT Madras uh, had some data with me at IIT, IIC had come and measured the data here with me. And then he has his distribution and that we could in this one. There is of course a region where uh, our uh, you know, predictions are still not, not good. We tried to look at our own data, our data also. The, again, there is a discrepancy, although on, the, on a different side. So this is our experimental data and then this is the model that we have. And uh, in this region, there is discrepancy. That is what I said, is a slug flow region one may have to look at in for greater uh, intensities to get uh, the actual distribution. So these, as I said, are, are you know, where right now, uh, I think Surya Prakash is here, he probably will talk about it tomorrow. And so he has a jet in cross flow. This is the type of flow you, of many interests in many different applications. In as far as aerospace propulsion is concerned, either the scramjet type of application or the ramjet or the afterburner, you try to have a flow, in, you know, injection to the cross flow and we try to look at that we are right now in the process of looking at how this breakup takes place you know it's probably people are familiar but it is there is a there's a what we refer to the shear breakup column breakup as we call there's a bag which forms and bag breaks up in the while forming a bag there is a rim that is formed the rim has certain dimension that's a certain mass content there are nodes between the bags that has a larger mass content and a concentrated mass. So the rim breakup, the, the node breakup, and of course the bag breakup, all these have to be described uh, to get to an understanding of this, which is what our current efforts are. Right now, my student, uh, Surya Prakash, I think he will have this presentation. If you look at different swirl numbers with, in the jets, in the liquid jet, there's a swirl. There's, it also means that uh, you know, swirling has an effect as, as it is, because there's a two sheets which comes out, there's a seed that bends and forms. So trying to plot, map it in terms of the, the Weber number on the air side, uh, Weber number, trying to look at the fact that you have the momentum ratio, multi, momentum ratio, if you just plot it for different swirl numbers, you get a large of uh, random distribution. Try to normalize with respect to momentum ratio with the swirl number, and plot it with respect to Weber number in a logarithmic plot, and you get you seem to get a pattern out of this. This is something of current interest. We are yet to understand it fully, and so uh, this is we are likely to pursue in the days to come. And I look forward to some wisdom from this group by the time we go. So this is where I want to stop and. Uh, I just say there is, we are looking as far as aerospace propulsion is concerned, a range of problems from gas turbine engine combustors, liquid propellant rocket motors, and scramjet engines and so on. A number of problems are looked at and uh, many, many problems, interesting problems at mechanistic level remains. And that's what I wanted to highlight. Today, of course, I am outdated with the Malvern particle sizer. Uh, people have much finer diagnostics. We are doing some modeling too, but then sure, modeling also has come to a final stage. So we will be able to describe the processes that I just described. You might find many of these underlying mechanisms that can be expected, modeled, simulated, and you can generate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Raghunandan, for the excellent lecture. So we probably have time to ask two questions.
Yeah. So if there are no questions, uh, let's once again thank Professor.